Let's imagine uh, language in the, uh, just before the invention of writing and that uh, uh, language we will personify as a character, a character who is endlessly expressive and can, uh, uh, can make almost all human emotions and uh, feelings uh, palpable. Uh, and because of this terrific ability to articulate what it feels like to, uh, to be itself, language is essentially happy but has one great longing, which is that nobody has, there's no way to remember all the wonderful things that language is able to say. So language is out in the woods one day and says, oh, I'd give anything in order to be, to be memorable, you know, to, so that, that what I say could be preserved. And the devil comes out from behind a tree and says, anything? And the deal is struck. Uh, writing is invented. And now all these things can be remembered, but they're just on a piece of paper. And all the stuff that language did to, uh, uh, that you and I can do as we sit here talking to one another, uh, facial expressions, shrugs of the shoulders, movements of the hands, what we call colloquially body language, all of that is gone. Poetry is the attempt to return all of that to, to written down language. Why did you start writing poetry? Oh, I mean, I started writing poetry to, uh, uh, I started writing poetry because there were whole parts of me that I knew were in there that were important that I was absolutely out of touch with. I felt mute in, in, uh, uh, in crucial ways. Um, and I had some intuitive sense that poetry was the, was the, uh, uh, was the, was the way to reach them. This is very selfish and, uh, and unartistic. Uh, decision on my part. If I were uh, more dramatic than I actually am, I would say I started writing poetry to, because I feared that the state of my soul was in trouble. Was poetry difficult for you when you first started or easy? Poetry was very difficult for me when I first started. Uh, I found that I could write poems that were um, reasonably skillful if I pared down what I asked of them so that the very first poems I wrote were rather simple, short, imagist poems written in uh, the style of the period, uh, if the period went from sort of Arthur Whaley's translations from the Chinese to the shorter poems of James Wright and everything that was highly imagistic in that period in American poetry. But if you had asked me to write a poem that was more complicated or that included more uh, uncertainty, more humor, more perilousness, I wouldn't have been able to do it. So I wrote poems of a size that I thought I could manage and then I kept making them bigger and bigger. Uh, if I had tried to write then poems of a size that I feel I've taught myself over 25 years to write, I would have simply been technically and emotionally underfunded for the project. Here's a short poem from my second book, which was published in 1972, which is a little down the line from those uh, poems we were just talking about. This is quite brief. And so, you grow in your cocoon of sleep like a dead sailor revived inside his flag. That's it. The difference between it and the very f earliest poems is that this is a poem which is beginning to not to use um, uh, metaphor as a way of describing emotional textures, but it's beginning to use metaphor as a way of making analogies and, 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 uh, and thinking and uh, really trying to yoke together disparate things.
the, the medium, the art, I suppose, I should say, which has provided me with the most uh, sort of joy and, and, and terror and so forth over the years has been music. And I remember being uh, taken uh, to the Cincinnati Zoo where they had summer opera. I believe that the performance was Aida and that uh, various surrounding animals joined in, uh, which is very appropriate because of the sure. animals Precision. in the triumphal march. Yes. Uh, my mother believes that this was a performance of La Boheme, but it's, it's characteristic in most families for these stories to come in two versions, yes. which are conflicting because each generation has a different investment in the story, so I don't know which is true. Uh, but I remember being absolutely mesmerized. It was the combination of the, uh, of the music, the, uh, the, the ridiculous splendor of the costuming and the production, and the way something so huge and creaky and artificial could produce these absolutely basic and unmixed emotions. The tenor's too fat, the beautiful young woman complains, and the soprano, dowdy and old. But what if Otello's not black, if Rigoletto's hump lists, if airy Gilda and her entourage of flesh outweigh the cello section? In fairy tales, the prince has a good heart, and so as an outward and visible sign of an inward invisible grace, his face is not creased, nor are his limbs gnarled. Our tenor holds in his liver-spotted hands the soprano's broad, burgeoning face. Their combined age is 97. There's spittle in both pinches of her mouth. A vein in his temple twitches like a worm. Their faces are a foot apart. His eyes widen with fear as he climbs to the high B-flat he'll have to hit and hold for five dire seconds and then they'll stay in their stalled hug for as long as we applaud. Franco Corelli once bit Birgit Nielsen's ear in just such a command embrace because he felt she'd upstaged him. Their costumes weigh 15 pounds apiece. They're poached in sweat and smell like fermenting pigs. Their voices rise and twine not from beauty nor from the lack of it, but from the hope for accuracy and passion both, they have to hit the note and the emotion, both with the one poor arrow of the voice. Beauties for amateurs. What factor does humor play in your own work? Well, I think that being in a sort of grim and serious pursuit of, uh, uh, of the meaning of one's own emotions is, a, is an essentially hilarious condition to be in that the kinds of things that we need to do to save our souls and to, to right ourselves when we've been bowled over by life, as we often are, uh, are, uh, are things that may be crucial but are also ridiculous. Humor for, is for me a way of, of, of navigating in, in the world and being in the world. I'm not talking now about humor in poetry, I'm talking about humor in life. I would like there to be as little difference between humor and poetry in my poetry and humor in my life as I could possibly arrange. I once heard, uh, um, I once co-taught a class with Stan Plumley, and somebody asked about a particular line and said, well, does this line break in the right way? And he said, what do you mean break? It looks, uh, it looks pretty sturdy to me, uh, which I thought was not an evasive or wise guy question, but a really interesting way of deflecting the attention uh, that to, from the end of the line to the line as a whole thing, which is, I mean, I, which is what must be what you mean by the integrity of the line, that if the line doesn't sag, if the line is taut and has what we would call on the top of a body water surface tension, uh, 
that's a good line. And uh, um, uh, I, I think that a, a good line for me is a line which is, though it may not grammatically be or it, uh, uh, a whole unit, it may not even be a whole unit of sense, that there's a feeling that it's not a piece of something, but that it's a thing by itself, even though in terms of the grammar of the whole sentence, it may need things before it and after it to complete it. But there's some sense that, it's, that it doesn't look like it's been busted off something else. It looks like it could be an object by itself. And the name of that object is a line of poetry. Why are people so interested in writing in free verse still after 40 years? Well, I think one of the reasons uh, people are interested in writing free verse so long after the revolution, and indeed the phrase free verse does have a kind of political ring to it. it uh, uh, to people of our era, it sounds a lot like Free Huey or Free the Pentametric Five, I suppose. We could imagine this being these, uh, the, the prisoners involved. Uh, and whatever battles that was about are long past us. And so the reasons people are interested to write free verse now must be evolved in different reasons. Uh, and. Uh, uh, I believe that free verse is very difficult to write well, and I think that the most interesting reason why people want to st still want to write free verse is that people have figured out that it's very difficult to do, and therefore challenging and interesting. Um, I think there are some people who want to write it because they think it's easy, and their work is cut out for them because it's very difficult to do. I think it's easier to write good verse in traditional forms than it is to write good free verse. Why? Why is that so? Because you have some standards uh, uh, for, uh, available to you and you, you have a kind of triangulation possible. You're, you're, writing, uh, uh, you're writing in three line stanzas and you have one rhyme in the, that you have to manage, let's say. And uh, so that you're able, as you're passing through that passage, you're, it, it's true that there's something that you want to discover to say that's just the right thing, but that sometimes the look off to the side that you have to make to make sure that the formal requirements of the passage are, are being satisfied in some way that's not uh, merely dutiful will um, al allows you a kind of triangulation with, this, with the subject matter. Often in writing free verse, it, uh, if you're not careful, the only two things that are, that, are, that are present at the desk are you and what you're going to say next. Uh, it requires a kind of directness of you, which is n perhaps not the, the ideal circumstance in poetry in which the uh, shortest distance between points A and point B seems to me to be never a straight line. In the case of writing a poem, uh, uh, you bring to the desk all the emotional uh, confusion and and uh, uh, and fascination and that you that you hold it uh, uh, and an accumulation of it from your whole life, but um, you're creating something that is going to rhyme with that and and be be consonant or assonant with it even, uh, and if there isn't that relationship between uh, what happens on the page and, and what's in your heart, you've, you've made nothing. You've made an empty thing, and you've been the helpless master of your own skill. But um, uh, when it works, when the relationship works, it's usually because you have taken your eye off the, 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 either the direct relationship with the emotion, which is often for me when writing a poem, not something I entirely understand yet until I get close to the end of the poem, on the one hand, and on the other hand, technique, which is only interesting so far as it helps you to discover emotion. It seems to me that questions of phrasing and rhythm and tone, think of how many interesting terms poetry and jazz have in common. Uh, that something about how to uh, uh, sustain a not absolutely regular uh, rhythmic performance uh, that the, uh, over, an, over an interesting period of time, that questions of improvisation in jazz and writing free verse are, are very close to one another. Uh, and uh, uh, one of the things that's, uh, uh, that's quite lovable about the best jazz is a strange combination uh, between the way it's a very technical and intellectual art in some ways. Nobody who ever played 
on stage with Dizzy Gillespie, he had to, could walk out onto the stage without knowing fewer than 300 songs chord changes, you realize that these people have digested an enormous amount of technical information simply to, to get to the jacks are better to open stage. Uh, on the other hand, there is something raw and emotional and uh, absolutely opposed to the, uh, uh, to the uh, sight reading, uh, reverential, get to the heart of what the composer intended notion that comes from the European uh, musical tradition, which I also happen to adore. Uh, but uh, uh, that combination of uh, learning a lot of technical information and then being able to make decisions on the fly so fast that you barely consult what you've learned uh, that, I, that has to do with uh, jazz playing it strikes me as having a lot to do with the composition of poetry, though of course the latter is a much slower and more tortoise-like uh, performance than, uh, uh, than jazz, which happens in real time. Well, uh, Mingus was a, uh, by an accident of timing, Mingus became a tutelary figure to me, not because he wanted to have a student. God knows, he didn't know it. I, I did this all from afar and in my head. Uh, uh, the way people that age conduct romances. Um, how old were you? I was 17, but there was a year when Mingus uh, took his, uh, was invited to take his band to a jazz club in uh, the village, uh, whose owner said, come play for six months, uh, bring your group, which was called the Jazz Workshop, and there was a great sense of something in foment, in construction, uh, that being not just things were being improvised, but a whole repertory and an attitude toward it and an ability to play it in more than one way was being developed on stage as they went along. Uh, it turned out that I was uh, attending a series of, uh, of uh, rehearsal slash performances that would become legendary and uh, I didn't know that. Um, uh, I didn't even really know what their project was when I first started going but it was a cool place to be and I liked it and I was fascinated by Mingus and what happened was that by continuing to go there I actually watched somebody perform in public um, his affection for and frustration for a very difficult project which he desperately loved and wanted to do. And uh, from uh, thinking of the music as a kind of uh, neat backdrop for my uh, suave adolescence, uh, which would be a not entirely inaccurate way to describe my motive for the first visit to what I had learned at the end of six months was I understood something about the amount of will and devotion and ferocity it took to make something valuable. Uh, and I even, I think, dimly understood that that something valuable could, was both uh, uh, a body of music and a life. I was miserable, of course. For I was 17, and so I swung into action and wrote a poem, and it was miserable. For that was how I thought poetry worked. You digested experience and shat literature. It was 1960 at the showplace, long since defunct on West 4th Street, and I sat at the bar casting beer money from a thin reel of wands, the kid in the city, big ears like a puppy. And I knew Mingus was a genius. I knew two other things, but, it, but as it happened, they were wrong. So I made him look at the poem. There's a lot of that going around, he said. And sweet baby Jesus, he was right. He glowered at me, but he didn't look as if he thought bad poems were dangerous the way some poets do. If they were baseball executives, they'd plot to destroy sandlots everywhere so that the game could be saved from children. Of course, later that night, he fired his pianist in mid-number and flurried him from the stand. We've suffered a diminuendo in personnel, he explained, and the band played on. Was Mingus aware of his audience while he was playing? He was, he, I, he, was, he was aware of an audience in complicated ways. I was in another bar 
uh, in the half note one night when he threw out a sleek looking young black guy and his rather chic date and he they were clinking glasses and flirting uh, and uh, uh, he brought the band to a halt in mid number and said you know this is this is your this is your heritage and if you don't want to pay attention to this there's someplace else you should be and he just stood there and waited till the guy got up and slunk out of the place uh, uh, and he had a very strong sense that uh, you know that this was black music first and that it was going to be American music uh, and it was not intended only for his black audience but if the roots of it in black experience uh, were not honored at least by the black community and ideally by the jazz community that something was wrong he was perfectly prepared to berate an audience on behalf of that point of view uh, he wanted you to shut up while he was playing and, uh, and not to clink glasses and talk and so forth. And I think, you know, I mean, I think that Mingus had, in relation to the jazz audience, the same feelings that I have, and I know you have, uh, toward the poetry audiences, that we wish desperately that it were larger than uh, some uh, cultural critics lament that it isn't. Uh, that we think that this is an art which is uh, uh, full of emotional power and full of entertainment in the deepest sense of the word and full of news about our emotional lives that we're unlikely to be able to get anywhere else and that um, uh, is sometimes frustrating that the audience rushes to these valuable things uh, as slowly and as thinly as it does. Uh, but he was also, you know, he was also, uh, uh, he was also a craftsman and a kind of monomaniac and he was perfectly willing to stand up there on the bandstand and, and lash them into as close to perfect, stayed as close to perfection as he could arrange. And I think at those times there was a sense in which he had no idea we were in the room. Poetry is a very rear guard and conservative form because it's about preserving, uh, it doesn't want anything that's ever existed in the language to erode and it wants the language to grow richer during, under its care. The truth is that poets are deeply conservative, that what poets really want is for nothing to ever change so that they can write about their childhood till they die at 90. I think what's been happening in American poetry over the last 15 or 20 years um, has been the, the, the increasing and deliberate decentralization of, uh, of our, our poetry, which at one time was located to a large degree um, in, in or near New York City. It had to do with all the publishers being there. It had to do with the major poetry organization, organizations being there. And the problems with it were problems that we're, we're well familiar with. It was, um, uh, it was provincial, uh, regional, uh, run by older, uh, uh, older white males whose sense of how many quieted voices there were in American society was not as adept or alert as it ought to be. And uh, uh, we've had an extraordinary number of interesting uh, women poets in the last generation and a half, far more interesting new women poets than male poets, it seems to me. Uh, we've got all kinds of poets of color, poets of various ethnic groups. I mean, it's as if there'd been a kind of, uh, not a big, but a small bang, and, and the, poet, the center of the poetry world has been rushing outward. And I think this has been terrifically good for the health of American poetry on the whole. It's created a kind of anxiety in the poetry community because nobody th believes that there's one standard for anything that's reliable anymore, so nobody knows where authority and value comes from, but that's the cost of killing off the patriarchy which would happily tell you what the one standard was, theirs. Uh, and uh, uh, I think uh, 
as long as the energy of the bang continues, American poetry will grow healthier and healthier. And the, the thing that's bad about it is that if people in the various groups that are created by this don't understand that the ultimate goal of this is richness in the gene pool and multiplicity, but start saying, we have the truth now, then you get, um, then you get a new version of the old problem. And we've had some of that. John Berman said that ambition was not an, an American uh, characteristic. Well, I, I, I think that good poets have it, but they have to hide it. <laughs> and so you will uh, uh, answer my next question. How ambitious are you? Well, I think that we have to hide it from ourselves. Uh, I, I'm less alarmed at having it be discovered by somebody else, particularly by you, a fellow practitioner, because you know that you have your own ambition that you hide as well, so you won't be that startled if, you, if I were to admit to this. Uh, I think we hide it from ourselves because um, it's not always useful. Uh, it's, it's almost always anti-useful or negatively useful when one is actually at the desk, when you would like to transfer the whole weight of your ambition to the palm and say to it like a, you know, um, like an anxious parent, you know, uh, I hope you have a really interesting life. <laughs> uh, 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 and mean it, you know, when we, when we say that, but when you sit, turn to your children, you say, you, 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 in truth, we say about our children, I hope you have a sort of interesting life. We don't want our children to have too interesting a life. <laughs> you know, who wants a really avant-garde child, you know? <laughs> uh, but, uh, 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 it's hard to know what the ambition is for. Is the ambition to be great? Is the ambition to be recognized as great? Is the amb I mean, if you were to say, what, is, what form does this ambition take? Most of the forms that you can first imagine are relatively tawdry. Uh, and are, some of them are so indistinct as targets that it's very hard to know how you would try to hit them. Uh, yet I think something like ambition, which could also, if I were Roger, I would list stubbornness, uh, durability, uh, flexibility. Uh, it has to do with the desire to continue, with the desire not to damage your talent, not to damage the instrument, to take care of it, not to lose your nerve, uh, to quietly set uh, high standards for yourself, and to be able to say, uh, as you grow older and older, uh, that um, uh, the demands of this art are incredibly high, but I think I'm nearly able to keep up with them.